this tension, you find it in a masterful way in Hitchcock, because uh, you know how do you see that Hitchcock was thinking in films? Alfred Hitchcock, uh, it's very interesting to read all these books, the making of, how did he do it? The original idea was, as a rule, not the narrative content. He imagined a certain purely formal movement, a certain movement of a camera, a certain gesture, and so on. And then he, with the help of scenario writers, constructed a story to fit this formal movement. And what I regret now, <laughs> three minutes, two minutes, <laughs> I will stop. What I regret is that, and it's my responsibility, that we were not able to show you here a very traditional clip, the second murder, second Arbogast from Hitchcock's Psycho. I think this is a wonderful example, maybe the best I know, of thinking in cinema. You know, Arbogast climbs the stairs in Mother House, and you have the standard Hitchcockian exchange of uh, point of view shot, Arbogast observing the stairs, and the objective shot of Arbogast climbing up. Okay, this is the standard way to create tension. But then, you know that famous twisted movement? The camera goes up, and you see this famous, what they call, God's view. And then when the creature enters and starts to step with a knife, Arbogast, you get into the point of view, impossible point of view shot of this creature. This is, I think, one of the elementary matrices of Hitchcock. And the first thing to do, I did this in my our hi collective Hitchcock volume, is I was surprised to discover how systematically Hitchcock resorted to the same procedure. For example, in The Birds, when you have that famous scene when fire explodes, some uh, a gasoline station explodes, there is big fire in Bodega Bay. You have Tippi Hendren looking at the uh, gasoline station exploding, the standard subjective objective, objective shot. Then you have the famous shot up there, so-called God's view shot from above. And then Hitchcock does something absolutely ingenious. Uh, you first think this is an objective shot like establishing shot, just. But then from behind, one bird enters, another bird enters, and the objective shot all of a sudden turns into a point of view shot. And this affects you as a viewer. You thought you are just identified with the camera. Oh, now we see it all. Then you see your gaze is evil embodied. It's so I claim there is a whole Hitchcockian Gnostic theology in this. How, you know, Hitchcockian theology is a very dark one, is that God is an ignorant, stupid God, and when he intervenes, it's Norman Bates, is divine <laughs> intervention, and so on. <laughs> and it's also narratively true. Like another way Hitchcock is thinking, and then you have to stop me, <laughs> otherwise it will end bad. <laughs> there is something that the two films share, that we all know and love, <laughs> Vertigo and Psycho. Both films can be imagined in a much shorter version around half. Look, how perfectly it would have worked. Imagine Psycho, which stops under shower, a uh, Marion under shower, just before uh, 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 the uh, uh, shower murder. It works perfectly. It's a morality story about a girl who, out of despair, steals money, then runs away there in the shape of Norman Bates. She sees what is ahead of her, the horror, and she withdraws and cleanses herself like she was on the brink of It works perfectly. Vertigo is the same. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, when, uh, when Madeleine uh, falls, so we think, from the tower, and we see uh, uh, Scotty, James Stewart, in total despair. Imagine that the movie, it's a short one hour movie, stops at that point. It's a perfect shitty psychological melodrama of how, out of excessive love, of, because of the pressure putting on her, how Scotty kills the woman he loves, and so on and so on. It works perfectly, but then you have 
part two, a total shift of perspective and so on and so on. You see, these things interest me and I am not here formalist in the, maybe, I'm not sure, although he thinks I'm a total idiot, I still up to a point appreciate him, David Bordwell, but <laughs> formalist in a different sense, in the sense that, you see, to understand the film, you should include into its content the message delivered by the autonomy of form. It's at that level that true thinking in cinema happens.